All right, thank you so much for returning to Anthracite Horror Stories. And I have a special video for my viewers this evening. This is essentially just an audio file. So it's basically just an audio book. So if you're looking for underground footage of coal mines in video form, this is not the video for you. So you might want to click off. Again, this is just me reading a 18 page paper and this paper is kind of special because it took one year of my life to research and then to write this paper and this was mandatory for me to receive my bachelor's degree from bloomsburg university in december of 2009 so a good majority of 2008 and basically all of 09, I had to research um, anthracite coal mine um, industry decline. And just every, every, anything I could get my hands on, I had to research this. Now, this was a controversial um, series of courses that history majors were required to take at Bloomsburg during this time because this is not a traditional bachelor's um, degree requirement at other universities. If you get a master's degree in uh, history, you have to take these two courses. And these two courses were called historiography and research and writing. And what historiography is, is you pick a topic and you're gonna look at everything that was written on this topic. And you have to look at primary sources and secondary sources. So primary sources say if you're doing something on George Washington, you would want to see everything that George Washington had to say on this topic that you're researching. He would be your primary source. And then a secondary source would be other historians and what they thought of this particular topic and newspapers, journals, letters, anything. And you have to research the living hell out of everyone else's work that um, even touched this topic. I would literally, so I did it on anthracite coal mining decline and how it affected several generations of um inhabitants in the Wyoming Valley. I had to scour everything, not just anthracite coal mining history, but just the decline in the industry. It was, it was wild and everything is cited insanely because I had two completely crazy professors. So historiography, you crunch all your primary and secondary sources. And the whole point of that is to come up with one paragraph where you analyze everything that was ever written on this topic and how you can add an original argument or an original new point of view that was never brought up before or research that was never done before and how you're going to add to this big picture. And I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be crazy. This is going to be awful. And naturally I had a freaky professor and they're out to get plagiarizers and <laughs> rule it with an iron fist. It was, it was something else. So I passed historiography. And again, I, I do this right here. I'm going to just read this quick little couple sentences. The following narrative was a research paper I completed while working on my history degree. It focused on the anthracite coal industry collapse of the 1950s in the Wyoming Valley and how my family and other families in the hard coal region interpreted it. It offers an insightful, detailed look into the lives of those who experience an economic and familial decline in a once industrious area. So I passed her course, and then I went on to this guy. Oh my God, research and writing. What research and writing is, they teach you how to now research this topic. And you start out small, and you just go through everything, again, that was not included in this original historical narrative on this topic that you were uh, researching, <laughs> you, you come out with your own viewpoint and research and your writing and your 
article. Um, it was something else. And this, this guy was, man, it was nuts. I was just going over all my work from these courses. I, I pulled out this huge binder, hundreds and thousands, thousands of pages of journal articles, actual books. And it, it, <laughs> I'm going to have to take a video of it one day just to show how much, how much research I did on the decline of the anthracite industry as a whole. But uh, I'll never forget this guy. He was whittling away people for plagiarism. <laughs> and it was just nuts because we started out with like 24 or 26 kids. And at the end of research and writing, there was four. There was four people. I was one of the four. Oh, my friend and I, we were so disgusted by the process though. It, it was just unnecessarily, ridiculously hard. But I have a pretty decent paper because of him. Man, when he went over like my final draft, I never saw anyone mark up a paper that much with crazy notations and oh it was nuts. It was like I oh man, I I, I have that draft and his destruction of it. <laughs> I showed my friend, my friend was like, oh my god man, what the hell is that? We all we all got chewed apart by him, uh, but I have a solid paper because of it. So I'm going to read that for you now. So let me know what you think of this. Um, it's just 18 pages. Don't know how long that will take to read. If I trip up on some words, I'm sorry. Uh, there is no typos in this because <laughs> this guy, whoo, he was something else again. Everything has been quadruple checked and I have 80 no my god I have more than 87 let me see here I have yeah 88 citations so I have not plagiarized anything nothing so it's not the best paper but if you're interested in the anthracite industry and more importantly the collapse of the industry in the 1950s and 60s and how it affected the coal mining generation the baby boomer generation and my generation uh you might want to listen to this so here it goes Dead Coal, personal stories concerning the anthracite mining closures in northeastern Pennsylvania and the legacy left behind by those who lived it, by Jude Matthew O'Donnell. The discovery of anthracite coal became a turning point for the rising power of the United States beginning during the American Industrial Revolution. The formation of the industry that was soon to follow shortly after the discovery of coal would also become definitive for inhabitants in northeastern Pennsylvania for more than 100 years. Before anthracite was discovered, the 400 square mile coal region of northeastern Pennsylvania was barely inhabited by people in the early 19th century. Only virgin wilderness was evident, with Native Americans still indigenous to the area. This was soon to change, however. Coal companies began to mine coal in the late 18th century but began large-scale operations in the 1820s. Other collieries began operations with every passing year after that 1820 decade mark. By the early 20th century, hundreds of thousands of people called the anthracite coal region home. Cities such as Wilkes-Barre and Scranton owe their very existence and growth to anthracite alone. Anthracite is a rare type of hard coal found in only a few parts of the world. In northeastern Pennsylvania, 95% of the reserves on Earth are found in a 400 square mile area. In the mid 19th century, this relatively small area powered 16% of America's entire energy output, thus helping fuel the American Industrial Revolution. What made this coal attractive for industry is its relative cleanliness when burned, its ability to stay lit, and excellent BTU output. By the Civil War, Mining was an economic powerhouse for the region and local economies for those living there. But around World War I, mining 
began a slow industrial decline. According to Alice Roberts, economists before World War I predicted that the coal industry could not last much longer due to such an unbalanced and exploitative philosophy. Many who worked for the industry and anyone living there during this time would likely agree with Roberts. The industry put profit before human life and ignored the advances of alternative fuels into the coal market. Union suppression in the arrogance of coal operators was the standard operating procedure for companies to follow from the Civil War to the 1960s. This downward spiral that would eventually arrive was a nightmare for people in the region that depended on the coal operations for income. In 1920, 175,000 men worked in the region's mines. By 1970, only 3,000 workers remained. About 2,000 mine-related workers remain as of early 2009. The industry is a shell of its former self. Vacant downtowns where businesses once flourished are numerously found in the anthracite coal region. High unemployment rates and an environmental wasteland will greet the visitor to the area. This decline differs remarkably from similar processes in other mining regions in the United States. Some historians such as Robert M. Weidenhammer and Walter H. Voskul have noted that this economic decline witnessed in the hard anthracite coal fields was premature with a series of complex reasons for its floundering. Thomas Dublin notes that this decline is a complicated picture of an economic crisis. Willard Miller states that difficulties of the industry have been attributed increasingly to complex mining pro problems. Historians, both professional and amateur, offer various reasons for the anthracite coal industry decline. The decline has been blamed on the Great War, labor conflict, high coal prices, competitive fuels, the coal company's practices, the mining union, local, state, and federal governments, the depression, mild weather, lack of innovation, railroad practices, and mining disasters such as the Knox mine disaster in Luzerne County. The decline of the industry brought emotional distress for the inhabitants of coal communities. They suffered from economic hardships, gender role changes, difficulties in establishing new industries, and other hardships that endure to this day. The history of this rich industry is even suffering a decline of its own. Anthracite coal preservation in northeastern Pennsylvania is near extinction. Neglect and land development has destroyed all but a few of the thousands of former coal sites. Only one coal breaker, the Huber, which one, once had hundreds similar to it, is the only one still standing in north, northern anthracite coal field in the Wyoming Valley. This breaker's future is uncertain, with many in the coal region even questioning the need to preserve it. Some vehemently want to remember the mining past. Others want to forget it because it has exacted immense damage on the area, not just physically, but emotionally. Justin O'Donnell, for example, feels negative towards the former coal industry and what it did to the Wyoming Valley, that he states, It was bad that coal was found to begin with. I think that the Wilkes-Barre Scranton area would have been a nice little river community like Bloomsburg or Tawanda. It, the Wyoming Valley, had already been established a farming area, a small manufacturing area. We would have been better off without the coal here. Anything would have been better than that. What it did, I'm not just talking about what it did to the land, but what it did to the people. Why does this all matter, you may be asking? Why is the industrialization in northeastern Pennsylvania even worth mentioning? It is important to understand because deindustrialization throughout the entire United States began on a large scale shortly after the anthracite industry collapsed. The larger scale deindustrialization throughout America was not brought on by the collapse of anthracite, but it is worth looking at because similar patterns arise wherever deindustrialization may occur. The Rust Belt in America's Midwest is a prime example of how the loss of industry there has the same features of decline witnessed in Northeastern Pennsylvania. 
Hundreds of communities similar to the Wyoming Valley have experienced their own Knox coal mine disaster due to manufacturing relocations. These former economic powerhouse industries have left the Midwest and Southern states for foreign soil due to tax break incentives. The once prosperous steel mills and oil refineries of Lake County, Indiana, once employed 50,000 local workers. Those jobs began laying off their workers in the early 1960s till, present, till present, causing severe hardships for anyone that relied on the manufacturing jobs in this area just outside of Chicago. These factory closings, like the old collieries in the Wyoming Valley, have eroded the local economies, destroyed other related business, and have seriously lowered the tax base, which forever changes the landscapes of a community. What did the displaced workers do in response to losing their jobs in the Rust Belt then? Similarly to Northeastern Pennsylvania, they worked at a lower paying jobs than they had previously held or simply could not find new means of income. Some of these Rust Belt areas outside of Chicago, like Wilkes-Barre and Scranton, have faced high crime rates in response to the dwindling economic base and job uncertainty. David Brady and Michael Wallace see the United States shifting from a manufacturing to a service-based economy, beginning in the late 1960s with the closures witnessed in the Rust Belt. The anthracite coal industry then, according to experts in history and economics, began its downward spiral almost 20 years earlier than the Rust Belt. The anthracite industry is a subject to take a further look at in order to understand deindustrialization in the United States as a whole then. A number of reliable historians have documented this anthracite coal mine phenomena and have listed the ensuing outcomes. Shortly after the anthracite industry eroded for good, Gregory Wilson notices that railroads, textile manufacturing, and steel companies began to crumble as industries of importance in Pennsylvania. Ben Marsh, a professor from Bucknell University, which is not far from the anthracite region, states, the towns in the coal valleys are damaged, too with downtowns too big and unemployment opportunities too limited for the current population. Marsh, e Marsh even adds that the people have a powerful sense of belonging just where they are, with such ties to these tired old places that they are reluctant to move under any circumstances. Even when faced with an active mine fire like the one beneath the town of Centralia, the people move slowly, resentfully, and not very far. This notion holds true throughout this research paper. Even though some individuals look at the region as a failure on multiple levels, they still frequently remain active in knowing what is occurring back home, either by the news or through family members. Even those that have moved, it has not been too far. Those interviewed that have moved have maintained a maximum of 200 miles from their hometowns. This paper will attempt to offer a coherent narrative into the anthracite coal industry decline and how three generations of northeastern Pennsylvania inhabitants were affected by it either directly or indirectly. The generations interviewed include the last mining generation, the baby boomer generation, and the children of the baby boomers. This paper is a case study of families who live or have once lived in the Wyoming Valley. To an extent, their stories can be similar as family stories passed down from one generation till the other become common knowledge. Do these different generations perceive the decline similarly? How aware is each group of the plight of the generation before them? How does each feel about the generation preceding the other? Is the anthracite history in the former coal region being properly preserved or forgotten? The ultimate question raised in this article is how have different generations of several families who experience the anthracite coal industry decline either directly or indirectly feel it has affected their lives and their family, either positively or negatively. What factors led to the demise of the industry do these people think? The decline is referred as the closing of the anthracite mines during the, the later 1950s, early 1960s era for this research paper. The closing of the mines is just the first part However, the economic and social hardships that were ushered in when the mines closed forever changed the attitudes and social atmosphere of the Wyoming Valley inhabitants.
From the evidence gathered, one will clearly see that all the individuals interviewed see the anthracite coal industry's collapse as a dark chapter for the Wyoming Valley's history. Some people stayed and regretted that decision, while others stayed and enjoyed themselves. Some left and never looked back, while others left but found themselves back in the Wyoming Valley where they began their lives. No matter what difficulties these people endured, either positive or negative, they all have a strong identity to the area. Even those such as Nick Malone and Joseph O'Donnell, who have left the area for new lives elsewhere, find themselves checking the news back home almost daily online. A strong sense of pride for where these people grew up engulfs these individuals, no matter what generation they may have lived through. The anthracite coal mining region had a lasting effect thus on them and still does. Even if they do not see it today, it has defined who they have become. Where does this complex process begin at then? The coal miners themselves offer some interesting views on the decline and what it meant for them. Unfortunately, only a few of these miners are alive today. Black lung disease has taken its toll on the aging population of coal employees. Simply the fact that these men are now well into their late 80s also explains why few are left to tell their stories. Tens of thousands of miners lost their lives while working in the anthracite mines during the industry's lifetime, excluding the hundreds of thousands of cases of black lung disease and still poses a threat to the few miners still working in the industry today. The first such miner interviewed is Leonard Solzinski, who worked for the Dorrance Colliery located in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania from 1938 until 1959 when the Knox mine disaster occurred. Andy Gotcha, like Mr. Solzinski, represents the last generation of underground anthracite miners. What makes Andy especially important is that he held his job in the coal industry in the Wyoming Valley until 1976. He kept his job title for some 17 years longer than the average miner. While employed underground, he worked for the Susquehanna Coal Company, centered out of Nanticoke, Pennsylvania. After the Knox incident, he worked for Kingston Excavating Company. After Knox, he worked in large open pit mountain strip mines. The mining generation you interviewed cites similar contributing factors amongst themselves for the loss of their jobs. When asked what they thought caused the collapse of the mining industry in the Wyoming Valley, they found common similarities. Leonard says, let me think. Uh, I'd say people started using gas. It was more convenient. No shoveling, less dirt. And that was the most important thing. The deep mining also got to be expensive. Mining coal for over 100 years, it got to a point where it got more expensive for the coal companies to operate. They had a hard time getting labor towards the end. When people started going to college and getting educated, they had a hard time getting help to work in the mines. It's dangerous work too, you know. Andy bluntly stated, all because of the flood, Knox. Every mine in the valley got flooded. The Knox disaster was not the sole explanation for the decline, Andy adds, citing partly because of Knox and that people didn't want to use coal. It was too dirty. We were shipping the coal to Hazleton. It's expensive shipping it that far. The Wyoming Valley wasn't really burning it anymore. Leonard offers a more detailed account for why he felt the industry no longer exists. He even says that the finances to operate deep mine became burdensome. A long list of complementing complex factors ended the industry, he claims. Dangerous conditions apparently became too much for the younger generations that grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania. Did these young men become tired of seeing people they know get blown up or die from black lung disease, disease possibly? Both of these men acknowledge that the coal markets were growing smaller. People turning to alternative fuels such as natural gas and oil were causing dwindling anthracite production numbers. Coal companies were not reacting fast enough to these market figures because no alternative fuels hurt the market until the 1920s. Marketing was virtually non-existent during the lifetime of the industry, which likely hurt growth potential for future markets. Only at the end of the hard coal era did these companies begin marketing campaigns such as the blue coal gimmick at the Huber Colliery. Do these miners know that the jobs they held were in potential jeopardy? Mr. Solzinski says, I knew it was in the decline, but there were very few jobs available in this area here. 
it was hard to get a job. And whatever jobs you found, they paid very, very minimum. I had to take the job because I didn't want to leave the area. It was hard for me to find a job when I first started coal mining. When I started working, it was on the decline people started turning to gas and oil. Even while Mr. Gotcha was strip mining, he was growing aware that this would not be profitable much longer. They were shutting the mines down. Big shots would come in and that was it. Miners like these men apparently knew their careers as miners were possibly coming to an end at any time. They kept their jobs because they made more income from mining as opposed to other jobs in the valley. Jobs are scarce, and one of the few guarantees was working for the coal companies. These jobs were the only thing they knew to do career-wise. Why did these miners stay in the Wyoming Valley then when they had such a limited career option? Many from Mr. Gotcha's generation have a strong sentimental attachment to the Wyoming Valley. Andy shares this explanation for why he loved the Wyoming Valley, stating, When I first got married, I worked in the mines for two years and then went to New Jersey to work, and I really missed the Wyoming Valley. Andy Gotcha worked at a TV factory in New Jersey during his short stay in that state. It wasn't my cup of tea, New Jersey. You got the trees, you got the fishing, you got the hunting. And there in New Jersey, you have nothing. And that's why I came back. Others such as Leonard stayed in order to help family members out. Leonard stayed because his family needed help running the local family grocery store. He felt obligated to sacrifice his potential success if he were to leave the valley. After the mines closed, it took him six years to find a new career. For whatever the reasons, many miners became glued to the valley and raised families there. The baby boom generation was a hard hit generation similar to the last mining generation. These individuals were mostly not old enough to work in the mines. After the mines closed, prospects for future work in the Wyoming Valley were limited. Most of the region's jobs stemmed from the mining industry either directly or indirectly. What did this generation think led to the dismantling of the anthracite coal industry? This generation will be examined in detail pertaining to family and which question was asked. The O'Donnell family will be the first family case study looked at. The O'Donnell's link to the coal industry comes from their father, Edmund, who worked for the Delaware and Hudson Railroad from the 1940s to the 1970s. This railroad was one of several primary movers of anthracite coal. In addition to railroading, the DNH owned many coal mines in the northern anthracite field. Justin O'Donnell, the youngest interviewed, chose to stay in the anthracite coal region in order to pursue a career with the Citizen's Voice, one of wilkes newspapers. Justin received a bachelor's degree in 1974 from King's College and has remained in the coal region since his birth in 1952. Joseph O'Donnell, his older brother, moved out of the Wyoming Valley in 1968 to Washington, D.C. in pursuit of a police officer job and never returned. He resides in Maryland. Mary Lou Collin, formerly an O'Donnell, left the area in the 1960s to pursue a career for Pratt Whitney Aircraft in East Hartford, Connecticut. She has since returned to the coal region for retirement. When asked what reasons led to the anthracite coal collapse, the members of this family offer several explanations. Justin explains that labor unrest, uncertainty of production, rising cost of production, and thereby resulting in higher costs for consumers. And finally, cheaper and cleaner alternatives such as oil and natural gas to the mining companies in. Joseph O'Donnell believes oil and gas were simply cheaper, adding that it was easier to get gas delivered than have two tons of anthracite delivered. How then did the O'Donnells cope with the bleak economic picture placed on their valley and thus themselves from the closure of the mines? Interestingly, only one of the three O'Donnell siblings interviewed received a college degree. Yet that one person finds himself worse off financially as opposed to his siblings that never attended college. For Justin O'Donnell, the labor force here was, the only, was only involved in one industry. When that industry collapsed, there was no other work, no place to go, and that meant leave the area or stay in the area and work for substandard wages. This becomes similar to the document mentioned in the introduction of this paper concerning the Rust Belt in the Midwest. 
In Brady and Wallace's article, they cite that some economists, ec economists doubt even dramatic service sector growth can benefit workers the way the manufacturing sector once did. Justin was one of those people who stayed in work for substandard wages. When someone makes a statement like this, you can't help but ask if they regretted staying in the area with such limited opportunities, both financially and possibly even socially. When asked if he would have made out better in life, possibly had he left, Justin quickly answers, this is something that I question constantly, adding, what if I left? Would I have done better? Even though his siblings lack a formal education, unlike him, they did better financially because they left the area and he and they both agree. More options in multiple realms of life awaited the person brave enough to leave the safe home environment of the Wyoming Valley, Justin felt. Socially, they are better off from leaving the area, also he explained, saying, there's a better life beyond the valley here, and uh, yeah, I question that all the time. When Joe was asked if he felt he did better in life from moving out of the valley, he said, absolutely. Based on my friends and family that left the wilkes area, I financially fared better than those who didn't leave the area, unfortunately. It's a shame because Wilkes-Barre is a great place to grow up. The people were friendly, the food was good, and it was just a great place to be a part of. I understand that it's not the same way now. There's no reason to come back, unfortunately. The decline personally affected Joseph O'Donnell like everyone else in his family. All my siblings up till me left the area because there was no work. Joseph sees that other industrial options were limited in the area after a collapse of coal in the Wyoming Valley. Only factory and service sector jobs really pres present, uh, present itself in the former coal region. There was no industry. There is no industry in that area. Factory type jobs weren't enough to keep the valley going. All the O'Donnells see the Wyoming Valley as being in distress still even 60 years after a collapse of the coal industry. Mary Lou has a pessimistic view of the future for the Wyoming Valley. There never was work and never will be work in that valley on a mass scale that I can think of, Mary Lou grimly closed with. Clean the whole place up. You know, there's so much corruption, everything going on, and the whole valley needs to be cleaned up. Physically, too. Everything is falling apart. It's not looking too good. The mining industry blocked other industries from coming in. This blocking of reindustrialization endures till this day, she mentions. Business on a large scale is still afraid to open new businesses here, even though there is an available workforce. How do the O'Donnell siblings feel the decline may have affected their father, who held a coal-related job? Justin says, yes, it did. The coal collapse affected his father. Because, first of all, he had a difficult time finding any kind of work because of the decline of the industry during the Depression. He was fortunate enough to find a job for the Delaware and Hudson Railroad in 1941, and the work curbed the decline for production temporarily anyway. And uh, during the war years, he was significantly gainfully employed. But after the war, around 1946, 1947, the production dropped significantly and the railroad owned many mines in the area here. The railroad was hauling less coal and that led to some of his coworkers being laid off because of declining production. And the railroad abandoned some branch line service to some of the collieries here. We were very lucky for his father to keep his job, but Yes, it affected the business of the railroad. In sharp contract, his brother Joseph does not feel that the decline hurt his father much. It, the decline, didn't affect him personally. He worked many years of double, triple shifts. He took all the overtime he could handle. He never took off from work. Mary Lou O'Donnell said, My father, I don't think so because he was fortunate, fortunate enough to get in with the railroad. Justin feels that the decline did affect his father, even though his other two siblings felt it didn't. Joseph and Mary Lou believed that the decline did not affect their father much, if at all. Maybe Edmund was forced to work overtime due to layoffs from the railroad, and Joseph could be confusing that for voluntary overtime. The fact of the matter is, Justin's mentioning of how branches of rail were being cut to collars and thus laying off men would ultimately close the Delaware and Hudson Coal Company in 1991, forcing it to be, to, forcing it to be sold to another railroad. If Edmund, Justin's father, did not retire when he did in 1976, his job would have potentially been on the line. Joseph Colin Jr., the son of Mary Lou, 
and who never lived in the Wyoming Valley is the next interviewee. Even though he was raised in Connecticut, he had a few things to say about how his mother may have been affected from the decline. Well, the decline might have actually helped my mother. The best thing I can come up with, with is that her generation was at the tail end of the anthracite coal industry. It was declining earlier than that, however. Due to the dangers of the job, it helped the decline proceed ahead, he points to. My dad didn't want to work there due to job security reasons and dangers of the job. For those reasons, they packed up and they went to New Jersey to work for Pratt Whitney. So it actually benefited her financially. Joe recognizes, even though he lives outside of the area, that other jobs were hard to come by in the anthracite region. Wondering how his mother may have felt about leaving the Wyoming Valley was an important question to pose. Joe says, not at first was she happy about leaving. When she found a job, it was all good. She was only a driveway. When she got older, she was glad that she had left. His story is close to that of his mother's. He mentions that his mother still feels somewhat negative about the region to this day, even though she has returned to live there. My mother still says it's a depressing place compared to the Northeast and other areas she's been to. The Valley is always 15 to 20 years behind us. She always said that. Joseph Jr. doesn't feel the region is lagging too far behind anymore, however, adding, I think it's catching up due to technology. The computer has changed everything. I think some industry has crept in a little bit. In my experience, I always see that everything always seems to be a little behind in the Wyoming Valley. Interestingly, similar to his mother, Joseph poses a question that many inhabitants of the region have always been wondering. Why industry never came in, I don't know. They always had the labor force. You had the highway systems. You got me. For many years, my mom said we built the industrial complex of this whole country. And that's what she said all the time. The Gibbons family, another baby boom generation, experienced the decline the harshest out of any family interviewed for this paper. The late Joseph Gibbons Sr., the father of Mary Beth, Eileen, and Joseph Jr., interviewed in this section, worked at the Dorrance Colliery in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, the same colliery as Mr. Slezinski. There, Joseph worked on the surface before World War II until the mine closed in 1959 from flooding brought on by the Knox coal mine disaster. Joseph was also a prisoner of war from World War II, and Mary Beth theorizes that his job loss may have put him over the edge psychologically. Mary Beth O'Donnell, formerly a Gibbons, just like her husband, stayed in the coal region her entire life and is a licensed practitioner nurse for a doctor's office just a short distance from the now abandoned Huber coal breaker. Eileen Malone, formerly a Gibbons, once moved out of the coal region for a short time and now has returned where she owns her real estate business. Joseph Gibbons Jr., now retired from Bell Atlantic Telephone Company, has lived in the Wyoming Valley his entire life. What reasons do the Gibbons siblings think contribute to the industry's closure? For Mary Beth, the decline was multi-factor and complex. People wanted an easier way out of burning anthracite. Coal burning was dirty and always needed tending. Gas and electric was an attractive alternative, although it was not as cheap. Even old coal baron's deaths in the 1950s were reasons she felt the decline became, was in full force. Eileen states, the underlining reasons, I think, for the decline was the greed of the mine owners. They were mining where they should not have been, and the immediate cause was the Knox mine disaster. That put the seal on it, but it, the anthracite industry in the Wyoming Valley, was going down before that. I think fewer men wanted to go down into the mines. I don't know if I'm accurate, but I think more people turned to gas and oil to heat their homes because people thought it was easier and cheaper. I just think that people were not interested in anthracite as they once were. Joe Gibbons Jr. mentions, Definitely an ox disaster of 59 was the final incident the industry could not deal with. Joseph Jr. witnessed the whirling pool of water that was engulfing the Knox mine and surrounding mines after his father took him there. You had too much water in certain mines was an underlying reason for high costs incurred by operators. Gas was also mentioned because people didn't want to tend fires anymore. If I could find someone, somebody to dump my ashes, I would burn anthracite was a popular theme he heard while growing up. This has even stayed by some people to this day. 
People simply felt that they were being burdened by the manual labor necessary accompanying burning anthracite coal. Did the Gibbon siblings see the loss of their father's job leading to family hardships when they grew up and in, into adulthood? Or was the experience they recalled similar to the O'Donnells, who could not even answer collectively if the decline even affected their father at all? In response to asking how her father's job loss at the Lehigh Valley Coal Company affected her family, Mary Beth says, yes, it affected me. It affected the whole family. We had no money coming in. He got into a depression. Jobs were scarce because everybody lost their jobs and there was an overabundance of people. We had no money coming in, very little money. He had to get help from his parents to help with food, mortgage. Times were not good. He did odd jobs. Food options in her household were limited. A pot of potato soup would have to last three or four days. He had various mediocre jobs, which created hardships for the family. It was until the mid to late 1960s until he got hired by the post office. It was a horrible time in my life. Eileen responds to the same question saying, he was out of a job and there was no other industry. I almost didn't go to St. Mary's school, which was the high school. Aunt Jeannie couldn't go to college, even though she had a scholarship. She had to take a job at Bell Telephone. It affected our family life tremendously. It was always hard to tell with his drinking what caused it. There really wasn't a lot of money ever, but this just made it worse. Joseph Jr. elaborates how his father lost his job, would bring in much suffering to the Gibbons household in the north end section of Wilkesbury. He was very depressed. Yeah, he's very depressed. For the first time in his life, he didn't have a job. He was dep depressed because about six months before Knox disaster, he got a promotion to shaft engineer. Well, my dad, he was a pretty good drinker and he'd come home a wild man many times. You never saw him back in those days. He was a wild man. I don't know if that had to do with the mind shutting down. It could have now that I think of it. I really never thought about it. That's just the way it was. Finances were terrible. Unfortunately, Joseph Sr. would also frequently argue and hit his wife when returning from the local bars. One time, Mary Beth was caught in the middle and accidentally struck in her kidney, which has caused permanent damage. Mary Beth, similarly to Joe, mentions that everything was very angst. He started to increase his drinking habits and came home in the wee hours of the night and became very abusive to my mother, caused a lot of family problems from the depression. Joe explains... Things were rough back then. I don't think they ever had a bank account and never had a new bike. I didn't have it bad, they say. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. The Christmas after the mines closed, I remember seeing one gift. Mary Beth got it all. Nobody else got anything, and I thought, oh, there isn't a Santa Claus. Joe was seven years old at the time. Again, it's no big deal. It's just the way it was. At least we didn't go hungry. There is no doubt in reading these quotes that the Gibbons household was a tough place to grow up in. Sacrifices were made by all of the family members and they worked as a team to get by financially. Did this legacy of financial difficulties brought on by deindustrialization in the Wyoming Valley pass on to their children? The children of Mary Beth, Eileen, and Joe Jr. have come a far away from their parents. All three are extremely successful and are fully aware of the issues their parents endured in response to a local economy they grew up in. Dr. Tara O'Donnell is the daughter of Mary Beth. She had to leave Plains Township, the city she was born in, to pursue her psychology doctoral career in New Jersey. Nick Malone, the son of Eileen, was born and raised in Wilkes-Barre and later moved out of the coal region in order to work for an architecture firm in New York City. Finally, Joseph Gibbons III, the son of Joseph Jr., had stayed in the coal region and is the head of Luzerne County Engineering. Ironically, he may possibly preserve a few mining sites such as the Huber Breaker and the Dorrance Fannery Complex, which was where his grandfather worked for some time when he was initially hired. Do the children of the Gibbon siblings see reasons for the unraveling of the anthracite business? From what I understand, it was because anthracite coal is no longer necessary because the industry was changing. Oil was becoming more prevalent, so um, the jobs um, 
started to draw jobs to different parts of the country. So the mines weren't needed, Dr. O'Donnell believes. Nick Malone had to quickly think back when asked and said, from what I've been told growing up, and you know what I've heard, the factors that come to mind for the anthracite decline are cheaper fuel sources and due to the Great Depression, certainly the other big factors were the disasters, especially the Knox, kind of crippled the industry in the valley. The decline was a combination of things. Number one, the market shifting, new technology, and the Knox mine disaster. Knox was a chain disaster and was never recoverable after that for Joseph Gibbons III. How do they look back at what their parents experienced during those early days of 1959? How has this decline also possibly affected them personally now in their own lives is an intriguing question that brought out detailed responses by all three grandchildren of Joseph. Posing the same questions Mary Beth witnessed concerning her father, I asked how she thinks the decline affected her mo mother in return. I don't think you can look at it in the context with one person. You have to look at the big picture. It's a generational thing. I think that led to Grandpa stop working in the mines because there were less jobs, so he worked at the post office and other jobs after that, I believe. I don't know how that directly affected Mom directly, but I think it changed the valley. I know you're looking at mom, but this shows how it's one generation to another generation. The stories, Pop, Joe Sr., telling me stories about his mind days. It was amazing to hear Pop tell about how he was in charge of pulling the coal cars out of the mines via top of, top of the shaft. It was amazing to hear him speak about that and know someone who did that and pass on his legacy and stories. Nick believes the decline did in fact affect his mother. Well, her lifelong dream was becoming a doctor. It was just not available due to her situation, the family situation. Putting her through school was not available. Her options were limited, definitely compared to our generations and what we have available. Nick shares most people's optimism for the Wyoming Valley and continues to hold high hopes for future prosperity. In regards to his mother, he says, it certainly affected her being a child growing up in that atmosphere. I think it affected her emotionally and her family economically. These things, what, her, what his mother experienced, were probably passed down to later generations and us through the way she was brought up and kind of leaned to the way she was becoming a parent. Joseph III agrees with his cousins and illustrates what the mines closures did to the valley. Well, I think the decline of anthracite coal affected our family definitely in an economic standpoint, but more so, I think, for the number of opportunities in the valley itself. The grandchildren of Joseph Sr. feel the decline has affected the valley both negatively and in a certain way positively. Dr. O'Donnell, interestingly, has a few insightful notions of why the valley, why the Wyoming Valley region is still lagging behind compared to other parts of Pennsylvania and the rest of the country. I think that being known as initially as a coal town that it prevented many businesses money from coming into the valley, I think they, the businesses, looked at it as saying, why should we come into that old blue collar economically strained area? Why would we waste our money so because of that? Um, the area has always been economically disadvantaged and still to this day, we still can't shake that image. Look at that 2020 documentary aired on March 27, 2009, where they referred to us as a struggling coal town. That's an image we can never shake and never will. Even in New Jersey, people say, oh, you're from Wilkesboro. That's an old coal mining town. And they don't even know that it doesn't occur around here anymore. I don't think it's an appreciated the local history by kids these days. Even kids from where I grew up didn't appreciate it. It was just accepted for what it was. We're too far removed from the situation, dangers to really appreciate it. I just wish other people outside of the valley could appreciate what we have to offer. I think growing up around here, you develop a different appreciation for what really matters and what's beautiful, you know, but the outsiders don't feel that it carries that personal meaning. Nick is not too far off from Tara's conclusion. Living in New York, I still check up on the news. I feel like the economy is struggling tremendously there. Things there seem to have shifted. Manufacturing has left in big numbers and most of the jobs now seem to be in the service industry. There does seem to be some signs of a turnaround and some healthy, but overall, at least the perception does still, to, still tend to be a depressed economy. 
never really rebounded from its heyday. Joseph III is blunt and concise with his conclusion on how the region experienced the decline of the industry. I personally believe the federal government profited from the hard workers in the area and we were never compensated back from when the time coal was peaking in the environmental aspect. Even though these three individuals may have slightly different ways of answering the question, they all seem to love a sense of pride in their hometowns. All three have a desire for the valley to bounce back and prosper again, even though just one still lives there. The anthracite coal decline forged a brand of toughness into the people who lived through it firsthand. The Gibbons family went from near ruin several decades back to prosperity in just one short generation. Mary Beth O'Donnell went from eating potato soup three consecutive nights in a row and receiving a $1 doll for Christmas while growing up. Now she enjoys a brand new home she built from years of hard work on a large lake just outside of the Wyoming Valley. Nick adds a positive quote concerning his family member's struggles before him. It's amazing to think that it was just one generation ago, his mother's struggles. Such a bizarre concept to us and the way we were raised. We were raised to think we can achieve anything. It just wasn't that way back then. There were certainly more roadblocks for people to do. I think the best of our mothers made the best out of the situations. It's amazing that one generation could turn around. It's incredible. Nick Malone now works on 3rd Avenue in New York City. Joseph Gibbons Sr. was proud that his family worked hard and achieved all that they have. It can be argued that Joseph Sr. instilled into his children the determination to succeed even when faced with overwhelming odds. The anthracite coal mining region had a lasting effect thus on them and still does, even if they do not see it today. At the extreme opposite side of the spectrum, some still remain pessimistic about the area and what the fall of the coal mining industry meant for the area and its history. A bleak picture for the Wyoming Valley after a collapse of the industry does present itself, no matter which way you might approach it. Upon asking Jesse O'Donnell if he would stay in the Wyoming Valley if he had the chance again, would he? He fired back immediately without letting me finish. Oh, and I'd probably have left. If I knew what I know... Now, I would have left. The physical environment was the problem to him, wasn't the problem to him. The economic one was the issue. The lack of the inability to make a decent living and to provide a legacy to your kids that they'd have a better life to. A lack of opportunity. That's what it comes down to. Do you think it's the anthracite coal region going to ever improve? No. No, I don't see that happening. The rug was pulled out from underneath the people because the industry was here for over 100 years. An exodus that began in the 1930s, that began as a trickle, became a torrent. Louise Cannon, whose father and grandfather worked for the Pine Ridge Colliery, Hudson Coal Company, explicitly adds, this is a bad region. The coal mines went under. I think it's a poor region compared to the rest of the country. The whole country now is bad. But this region, after the mines, what did we get? Some factories? Even though Andy liked the mines and was somewhat nostalgic about his past mining experiences, he remarks that nothing lasts forever. Remember that. Perhaps some good can come out of the last quote. Maybe one day the economic situation and other challenges brought about from the decline will no longer last forever. For most that live through the decline of anthracite, these issues feel as though they have already lasted forever and will continue to do so. One thing is certain from the history of the region. No matter what occurs here, the people will find a way to cope and persevere while maintaining an appreciation for the sacrifices that the previous generation made. Ben Marsh also concludes that, difficult times in the early coal towns created communities so strong as to discourage people from leaving the unproductive landscape, even now that the hard coal industry is essentially dead. And that's the end of my paper. Hope you enjoyed this. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Be sure to subscribe. Thank you.